For those of you that haven't joined me before, my name is Joe Brady. I am the webinar marketing manager here at the Mac Group. And yes, I did get a lot of grief about my uh, headshot that had been up forever. So I did change that. And this is showing one of my other passions. So uh, I have the great job of being able to create and present educational materials for photographers. And I use this stuff in my everyday work. And uh, it's real important to me that I get my prints back the first time every time without any problems. So uh, that it, putting a color workflow into place has allowed that to happen for me. And uh, that has been really important. OK, so yes, as I said, I got a lot of grief about my headshot. So yes, here's a new one. But uh, we're not here to talk about guitars today. We're here to talk about photography. And once I put a color workflow into place, then I have found that I don't have to uh, reprint. I get my prints back from my lab. Uh, there's four major labs that I use, whether I'm having prints or posters, or if I'm doing books, I consistently can get back uh, a print that looks exactly what I see on my screen, and that's what we're after to today. And what we're after really is consistency. And consistency is what allows us to get reproducible color. Understand that, of course, your monitor can display colors that maybe your printer can't print. It's a backlit RGB device. Your printer's using CMYK inks, uh, so they're going to be a little bit different. But what, if we can get accurate and reproducible color, then we'll have consistent results. And we'll know that maybe if we're going out to a certain paper, maybe we want to uh, boost it up a little bit. And that's what profiles do. Profiles basically translate color from one place to another so that they reproduce as closely as possible. So what is this consistency going to do for us? Why is it important? Well, certainly, first of all, it's going to save you a lot of time. I don't know how many of you like printing uh, the same thing five times to get a good print. I am not one of them. And also, we've all seen how much money ink and paper cost, particularly inks. Uh, I just recently heard the other day that uh, um, inkjet inks are among the most expensive liquids on the planet. So uh, we don't want to waste those. It will also save you a lot of frustration as well. So how do you accomplish this? Well, we're going to start thinking about it right at Capture. Uh, we're going to talk about, obviously, monitor uh, pro, uh, calibration and profiling. I'm going to go over how to create a custom printer profile. And we're not going to leave it there. I'm not going to just show you how to create profiles. I'm going to show you how to put them to use. We're going to go into Photoshop Live. And I'm going to show you how to soft proof, which allows us to see what effect the profile has on the print before we ever go out to print. And also, when you're doing your own printing, we'll make sure that the print settings don't start to interfere, because that is also a problem. And as I mentioned, mod first camera, right at capture, monitor, printer profile, soft proofing, and then the print settings. All right, so let's start right at capture. First of all, when possible, custom white balance. I do like to do this a lot. Uh, a lot of folks ask me about custom white balance. How big do you have to fill the screen? I personally use the Color Checker Passport. I, it's always with me in my camera bag. It's small, it's compact. And most cameras, when you're doing custom white balance, you don't need to fill the frame. All you need to do is just fill that center focusing circle. But if I have a custom white balance, that travels along with my file. And if it's a kind of situation where it's not convenient, let's say, for example, you're shooting a wedding uh, where a custom white balance is just really not practical, then I will just flip up the target when the light changes. So if it goes from sunny to cloudy or if I go inside, I'll, I'll flip this up and take a shot of the target so that I can white balance in software later. The other thing I do is take a shot of the Color Checker Passport, the entire color chart, because this allows me to create a custom camera profile. Again, a subject for another day, but an amazing device, uh, a very small investment, but it will save your color editing time. Uh, amazing. It'll pay for itself the first time you use it. Now, RAW versus JPEG. Uh, I hope most of you are shooting RAW, uh, because that allows you to take care, uh, advantage of profiles. It is true that a RAW file does not have a, custom, have a white balance built into it. But if you do do that custom white balance, the two advantages are, one, as I mentioned, that uh, white balance information travels along with the file. So when you bring it into Photoshop or Lightroom or whatever it is you're using, uh, the data is already there as the default. Secondly, uh, the JPEG that you see on the back of your camera, that little preview you see after you take a shot, is actually a JPEG processed with the data 
uh, that your camera was set with. So if you have a custom white balance, you're going to get the most accurate JPEG and most accurate histogram. Um, now Don asked a good question, do I set the custom white balance in camera or shoot the card for post-processing? Uh, depends on the situation. If I'm doing a studio shoot or if I'm doing um, landscape work, I will do a custom white balance in the camera because then it's going to be perfect and that data will travel with the image. Uh, if it's kind of a crazy changing light, clouds flying over, uh, shooting a wedding, then I will take a shot of the card and use it for post-processing. So both ways are, are valid. And I would also say uh, say no to auto white balance. Uh, auto white balance is, some people like it, I personally hate it. Uh, the problem with auto white balance is it changes the white balance for every image. Uh, if you have someone new walk into the scene, maybe wearing a different color clothing, uh, the light changes a little bit, a cloud passes over, every shot's going to be slightly different. And I do a lot of landscape work, I do a lot of uh, panoramics, and I stitch them together. And if you have them on auto white balance, then everyone's going to have to be different. I'm going to have to, I'd have to go in and manually adjust those. So I pick a fixed white balance if I didn't have a chance to custom. Again, custom white balance first. Uh, if that's not possible, I will pick a fixed reference. If it's sunny out, pick the sunny icon. If it's cloudy, pick the cloudy. Then you can make wholesale changes to your images if you need to. Again, if you're shooting raw, it's a little more flexible than if you're in JPEG. But uh, it's just a, a good workflow. Uh, now, and everybody's camera is a little different as far as white balance. Uh, for example, uh, Canon cameras, if you, you take a picture of your white target first, then you go to the menu and say, choose this image for my white balance. Uh, some cameras do it the other way around. You, you choose in the menu, create custom white balance, and then it tells you to take a shot. Uh, so it depends. Now, I'm not going to... Um, uh, go into the details of the passport, that is another webinar, but one thing I will say is, uh, Annette asks, what color balance option do I use when shooting the passport? Doesn't really matter because, remember, it's going to be a raw file, and the passport software, when it goes to create the profile, ignores all the camera settings. Uh, it's just going to uh, use the passport raw data uh, to create its profile. So it really doesn't matter what settings you had on the camera as long as you did it with raw. Now, if you're in a situation where you've got constantly changing lights, Axel asked this. Uh, if theater work, for example, and Axel, which I, which I do do, uh, I do shoot theater work, um, that is a little bit, little bit trickier. Uh, typically, though, theater work, lights changing are changing a lot. And for the vast majority of theater lights, they are tungsten balanced lights. So uh, you ju usually don't want to filter out those lights. So in that case, I'd recommend setting your camera on tungsten. Uh, sometimes if there is a, a generic white setting, uh, I will go into the theater ahead time, uh, have the white lights just turned on, do a reference shot of the card, and then take it from there. Again, a subject for more detail for another um, another day. Oh, and yes, a good question and asked. Meter for correct exposure. Yes, you must uh, have a good exposure. If you're overexposed, it's not going to work. Um, uh, many of you joined me this past Friday. I did a live video seminar on using a meter with ambient lighting, and there'll be another one coming up. We'll send you all an email about that. Uh, I am I'm a big fan of handheld meters because they don't get fooled. So yes, I meter before I shoot. And as far as focus of the passport, let me just go back to that one more time. Does it have to be in focus? Kinda. It doesn't have to be tack sharp. If it's a little bit fuzzy, it's okay. But you need to be able to see the grid because that's kind of how the software uh, finds the target. Okay, so we've got our shot. We've got, a, we've got a white balance set for it. We've got a custom profile ready in the can. Before you do any editing, then it's time to get to your monitor. Your monitor is the single most important piece in the workflow for uh, getting your prints to be looking right. Because if you think about it, that's where you're making all your decisions. Uh, if your monitor is off, then the decisions you're going to make are going to be wrong. So we're going to do this live in just a second. Uh, just a couple of examples. I love to show these. I never get tired of these. There's a couple of uh, um, uh, optical illusions here. You might have seen this before. And these are just examples of why you can't rely on your eyes to do your monitor profiling. Uh, this image is kind of a famous one. And if you look on the uh, the checkerboard here, you see two squares labeled A and B, and it's hard to believe that they are exactly the same color and tone. 
But uh, what I did was I went in Photoshop, I sampled off of this gray, and put two bars next to it overlapping, and you see when you do that, they are in fact exactly the same shade. When you pull them off, it's almost like the, the one labeled B starts out darker and then lightens up to your eyes. It's how your, your eye really gets fooled by this. It's kind of freaky, actually. Uh, but you get to see how neighboring colors and tones will affect that. This is a good example of why you shouldn't have really bright colors on your monitor when you're trying to do editing. Uh, all my editing monitors are set to uh, uh, kind of a mid-gray. Okay, so we saw that. Let's take a look at another example. Again, now, in this case, these two rectangles in the middle over here. Would you believe they're exactly the same? So let's let's add some stuff to help us along here. I'll put a couple of dots here and these dots are the same exact color too. Can't tell though. Let's take away the background. Okay, getting a little bit better and now you can kind of see that the rectangles are the same. We pull those away and then you get to see that in fact the dots are exactly the same when we connect them. All right, and again, for those of you with iMac monitors, if you join late, I am going to discuss that in just a minute when we get into the Color Monkey software, uh, because that is a problem. A lot of the iMacs and some of your other people are having problems with overly bright monitors, and we will discuss that. And I also see one or two of you are having trouble not seeing a picture on the monitor. Uh, everyone else is seeing it now, so what I would recommend is... Uh, go ahead and exit and come on back in because uh, I'm looking at the presentation on another monitor uh, as we uh, as we speak here so I can see it is coming through so if you are having trouble uh, I'd recommend you exit and then come on back okay so in this example we've got a couple of different squares that all look very different would you believe squares three and four are actually exactly the same color let's uh, take away one and two all right maybe a little bit better but when we put four over top of three, then you get to see they are, in fact, exactly the same. And we'll do one last one. Uh, this happens, again, with colors as well. Uh, here we see these blues. Obviously, the blue on the right looks darker than the one on the left. But pull away the black bars, and you get to see they are, in fact, exactly the same exactly the same color so all this the moral of this story is basically that you can't do this stuff by eye you've got to have hardware to do that and one of the reasons I'm a big fan of the color monkey is uh, well one it's very fast and two it does everything for me it does my monitors it does my uh, LCD projectors and it does my printers so as I mentioned your monitor it has the single biggest influence on your print because that's where you're making your editing decisions. If your monitor's too bright, as happens all the time, uh, if you haven't gotten it under control, if the color's off, maybe it's set a little too yellow or too blue. Uh, blue is common because uh, uh, overly blue monitors make video look good or games, but not for photography. So we got to get that under control. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're going to do the color monkey. And I'm actually presenting to you on my MacBook Pro. And uh, I'm just using my, uh, my laptop. Uh, but I also, uh, when I'm doing work at home, will plug my laptop into a desktop monitor. And I also have a tower with two monitors. So all my monitors get calibrated using the Color Monkey and another device that I will show you at the end of the presentation. So actually, let's go in. <clears throat> I'm going to actually go live into the Color Monkey software. Because I want to show you actually how things work. So let me hide the other stuff to clean up the screen here. And what we're after is right here, match my printer to my display. That's what we're, our goal is today. We want to make sure our prints come out looking like the image on the monitor. So I just click on there. And it's kind of a wizard interface. It really doesn't assume any color knowledge on your part. It's just going to ask you questions. Now, I've got a laptop, as I mentioned. Yeah, this says LCD here. Really, it just should say desktop. doesn't matter if it's an LCD or an LED or a CRT. That's the, cho the choice you would make here. And you see also projector, which I will address a little bit later because we use a projector um, uh, in our studio. So <clears throat> it doesn't matter what kind of monitor to have. Uh, Sue asked, does it work with the backlit iMac screens, the new LED screens? The answer to that is yes, it does. Now, the software, the first time you use it, defaults to this easy. I highly recommend you click on the Advanced button because there's two important questions you have to ask. 
well actually one you really have to decide first of all do you want to set the brightness based on the ambient light or do you want to set the brightness to a fixed level now if you're in an office or you're in a studio where the lights pretty constant then I would use the first choice set the luminance based on the ambient light however <clears throat> if you're using a laptop like I am right now I will pick a number and if I click on the number over here you see a range from 80 to 140 now this is uh, candelas per meter squared if anyone cares that's just how measure that's just how uh, uh, brightness is measured and the lower the number you can go the better at 80 you've got the greatest tonal range that you can tell the difference between deep shadows uh, and and real black and bright highlights and white above that you start to compromise a little bit now 120 is kind of a compromise uh, if you're in say an office that's got cubicles and you got overhead lights and maybe you don't even you don't have a hood for your monitor 120 is a number that you can live with where the brightness will uh, kind of compromise for that it does go up to 140 I think that's pushing it a bit um, so 120 is kind of the highest and this is my personal recommendation that I would go but whenever possible I would go for 80 and for a laptop default where my laptops always traveling around I choose a number of 100 it's kind of a compromise a little side note something really important you do need to turn off uh, for you guys that have laptops with cameras built in them I'm gonna go in the system preferences here because my laptop has a camera in it and if you go to displays you'll see down here a brightness level and you see this thing where it says automatically adjust brightness as ambient light changes and what that's doing is it's actually reading through the camera inside uh, the MacBook's uh, face the ambient light and adjusting the brightness you don't want this turned on because if you do it's going to cause havoc make sure if you have one of those auto brightness things that it gets turned off now I don't always show the ambient now I'm kind of in a dim room so I'm actually going to go ahead and do it based on ambient now the, the other question you need to answer and the answer is fairly simple though some people will tell you otherwise is the white point of your display for the vast majority of you it's going to be D65 or which is another way of saying 6500K there are some labs out there that are still preaching D50 for your monitors and I'm gonna warn you and tell you the answer to that is no don't listen to them uh, if you go to D50, the problem is most the most monitors have a native white point of D65 or much higher, not lower. And if you try to force your native white down to D50, it might give you a neutral at, at that 5000K number, but it's going to screw up colors uh, out beyond that. So my answer is say no. D65, your prints will come back great. Okay, so we're going to choose the ambient light mode measuring and it gives us a picture of the color monkey and there's a you can see this kind of a wheel here and these three little buttons uh, make sure you don't push in these buttons when you're doing any kind of spinning of this wheel because that's actually the same as a mouse click and it will advance the software on you but anything I do on to the monkey it actually mirrors on the screen as I rotate the wheel it actually shows me on the screen where it is so it's telling me it wants to be there which is the calibration part and what actually happens is there's a little white target, a little white tile in there, that the color monkey has its own little white uh, light source, and it will, in essence, white balance itself. It's doing its own kind of custom white balance to its target so that it's then calibrated for everything from there. Now, now it tells me to put the, dome, the, uh, the color monkey pointing to the top here, and if you looked at the color monkey, you'd see there's a, a kind of a translucent dome up here. So then I click on Next, and it says put it next to your monitor and click on measure so it's going to actually measure the brightness of the ambient light so I'm in a dim room right now it's only 70 lux uh, so it says it's going to make set my monitor to 80 which is just fine so then I spin it back down to get ready for measurement and click on next so then it tells you to place your color monkey here now for some of you that have the brightness issues um, you can let, well, let's go through the process first, and let's see what the uh, the software comes back with. So I'm going to go ahead and just hang the color monkey on there and get things started. So it will first measure brightness, brightness and contrast. 
Uh, you don't have any control over the contrast. It's just going to measure and make sure everything's okay, and they don't move on to brightness. Uh, and by the way, uh, Lisa asks, what's the difference between an iOne Display 2 and the Color Monkey? Uh, the iOne Display 2 only does monitors. That's all it does. It will do a monitor profile for you, uh, but it doesn't do projectors, and it does not do printers. Okay. So let's see. So you can see we asked for 80 for our luminance and the measured white luminance because I had my screen turned all the way up was 273. Not a good thing. We need to bring that down. So on my laptop I can just hit the down brightness button and ooh, that was pretty lucky. Let's see. All right. It's catching up. And you can see as I do this you can see the indicator kind of coming in here and I got lucky. I got within one. As long as you're kind of within 10, that's close enough. You just really want to kind of aim for this green. Now, this is the problem that some of you have with monitors that are too bright. Um, so, what do you do if you've got a monitor that's too bright? Well, it depends on how too bright it is. If you can get it to 100 or 120, that's okay. Then just go with that and understand your prints are going to come back just a smidge darker. However, if you've got, uh, we have an iMac in our studio that, that acts this way. It only comes down about 160 is as low as it will go. So there's two solutions. One's expensive and one's free. The expensive one is better, but free is better too. The expensive solution is actually to hook up another monitor to your computer, which is what we did with our iMac, because it is a studio machine that is used for editing. So what we do, did is plugged in a really good graphics monitor to the iMac and do the editing on there. However, that's not an option for everyone. So if for you iMac folks out there, there is a website, um, a company called Charcoal Design, that makes a utility for Macs called Shades. And what it will do is further dim your screen down to an acceptable level. Now, a little warning with it is, it will also change the color. So do not judge the color of your images uh, with the Shades Utility um, um, Live. So what you have to do is kind of judge your images in two steps. You judge your brightness with the Shades Utility turned on, and you judge your color with it turned off. Uh, and on the PC side, I know there's all kinds of forum uh, things about uh, Vista and Vista and even XP. Uh, so if you just do a search in Google, say my monitor, my PC monitor is too bright, you'll get a handful of uh, um, answers there. Uh, Frank asked a good question. If you can't get the reader right on the center, uh, is a little above or a little below okay? Yeah. Uh, just kind of want to be in the center circle. Uh, you don't want to be over in the corners because your monitor is actually unless you have a really good one, are not that uh, particularly uniform, unless you have a real expensive monitor. So kind of stay in the center. Sorry, right, so we got our brightness set, so we click on Next, and off it goes. Now it's going to do the color part. So that first part was actually the calibration. Uh, this is uh, the profiling part. And what it's doing is sending up known values. So, for example, after red, it will go to green. So that's supposed to be 100% green, say. Well, let's, the color monkey measures what actually shows up. And let's say that this green has 3% no, blue in it. That gets recorded, and basically a profile corrects for those uh, variations in what shows up versus what's asked for. All happens in the background, automatically gets saved, automatically gets put to use. And then what happens is, next time you're in Photoshop, and Photoshop says, well, I'd like 100% green in this part of the screen, please, that goes through the profile. And the profile says, remember to take out that 3% blue. Now, again, to Frank, Frank asks, should you go above or below the center? I can't give you an answer for that, because it depends on your monitor. Um, they're, they're kind of all over the place, so... Uh, Okay, and stay tuned because I will have some more information on that. All right, so the, mon the, the beauty, again, of the Color Monkey is it is blazingly fast compared to most systems that take anywhere from 5 to 10 minutes. This does the thing in the less than a minute. Uh, give it a name. I like to give it a date so I kind of know when I did my profile. So I will call it, I'm just going to call it MacBook and 720, did I see it was 726? I have no idea what day it is in the summer. Okay, 726, and I will just save that. It tells me the profile is complete. Now, there is a reminder that comes up. Some people love this, some people hate it. Me personally, I don't want to be reminded. Um, if you're on a Mac, I can tell you where to turn it off, the reminder. 
Uh, if you're on a PC, then I'm, I can't, I'm not sure where it is. Uh, you'd have to go uh, basically run the profile again, and when you're done, turn this off. Uh, on a Mac, by the way, if you have the reminder set and you want to turn it off, it's under System Accounts and your login items and it would show up here uh, as, a, as the color monkey reminder and you can just select it and delete it so that's where that lives for those of you guys that don't like to be nagged and I'm one of them I profile my monitor all the time thanks okay so I've got my monitor now you'll get a before and after um, you guys probably wouldn't see anything here uh, because it's just a screencast but on my monitor I am seeing a big difference so now I know my monitor is correct. Now it's time to move on to the printer. Now when it says match my display to my printer or my printer to my display, um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a misnomer. They're not actually even talking to each other. Your computer monitor doesn't even know there's a display there. But if your monitor is profiled correctly and your, dis, your, your uh, printer is profiled correctly, then guess what? They match. So I'm going to use a different paper today. One of my favorite papers. I like to print on fine art papers. Uh, and I'm going to use my Epson 2880 and I'm going to use Somerset Velvet. And let's see, today's Tuesday, so I'm going to call it Tuesday Velvet. Now again, my personal naming thing is I put CM, whoops, I put CM in the front of my profile names because they show up alphabetically in Photoshop. Uh, and I can't, by CM, I mean Color Monkey. That means all my Color Monkey profiles that I've created are together. We'll see this when we go into Photoshop. All right, so it says print the first target. Now, when you click on that, it says make sure your printer driver matches uh, the page settings or the, the paper type. Now, I don't even actually have my printer plugged in here, so we're going to see a dialog box that isn't going to completely match. I actually have a velvet setting here. So I'm going to go to print settings first, and I need to make sure that my paper settings match. As I mentioned, my printer is not actually connected, uh, but I would have to have uh, matte, matte ink in my printer, and I would have uh, Somerset Velvet show up here. So we'll make believe that uh, I chose Somerset Velvet here. 16-bit for channel, if your printer uh, supports it, by all means, turn it on. This is the one that will cause you trouble. Make sure on color settings that this is not the setting. This is the default. The Epson standard sRGB is the default color setting. You got to turn that off. Uh, if you're using Canon or HP's, basically anywhere it says color management, make sure you turn it off. So very important. Uh, a couple of questions while we're here that uh, uh, are important. Uh, yes, it is shades like is in sunglasses uh, and make sure Correct your color first and then turn it on to judge your brightness, yes. Now, if you get interrupted when you're doing your targets, uh, that's not a problem, actually. You can always come back. Uh, in fact, I'm not actually printing my targets. I've already got them. So you could print your targets and come back next week and read them in. That's not really an issue. Um, and if for those of you that are using laptops and you're adjusting the brightness um, and you, you, you're going to maybe leave your dark room and go to light and bring the brightness up, well, actually you can kind of count so I can see that I have I'm six I'm six stops down for six buttons down for my highest reading you can kinda of go with that that'll that'll be pretty close um, and our Bob asked about black and white printing and I will talk about that in a little bit uh, and the paper types that are show up in this media type come from the printer driver. That's a good question um, that Rick asks. Uh, the paper types will get installed when you install the printer driver. If you load in some other papers, maybe you're using some fine art paper from uh, uh, somebody like Ilford, uh, they do offer driver uh, additions that will show up. Uh, or they tell you use one of the manufacturer's printers that closely matches it because we're going to create a custom profile for this paper uh, which is going to override some of these settings really ba basically what you're after is you want to make sure that uh, glossy luster matte etc will be the same okay so we've got our settings high speed uh, is is printer dependent uh, you, high speed, what it does is it prints in both directions and it just makes it faster. Uh, if your printer is printing well and not leaving any streaking, you can leave that on. Uh, I generally do. Uh, and as far as my setting goes, 
generally the middle setting is the one I choose as far as quality. Um, I, again, I can tell you personally, I, I never use the super photo setting because it's not increasing the resolution. It's making it sound like 5760 dots per inch is the resolution. It's not. It's how much ink it's putting down. So basically it's putting down four times as much ink and yeah, ink is expensive. So I don't see a big difference between these two. You can try it once yourself. That's again, my way of working. So I then save this setting, save these settings. And the reason for that is every time I want to go print on the velvet paper again, everything's dialed in. I don't have to go mess with ever any of these settings ever again. So I'm actually going to cancel because I already have my target. So if, for example, you had created a target and then wanted to come back later, here we go. So I already have my target and it says read it in. Now this is not a video seminar, even though we have started doing those. But let me just show you a quick little animation here that shows what I'll do. I'll actually do this live for you. You just make the trick is make sure you start on white paper and end on white paper. That's the biggest trick. And then when you go to the next row, again, click, drag across, stop on white, and then let go. Now, this person, this animation is doing it to my liking kind of slow. I actually do this pretty fast. You don't have to take your time. So I just click and drag, click, drag across. You can go that fast. Just make sure you kind of stay in the lines. If by chance you mess up, or you turn away, you go across the lines like I just did there, it circles it in red, and then comes back in yellow and says, all right, can continue, and that's it. I just scanned in 50 targets, 50 patches on that target. You don't have to do each individual one. Now, it's doing something that's kind of unique to the Color Monkey, is it's generating a second target based on what it's learned from the first one. And it's going to do a second set of patches that are more skin tone, earth tone oriented. So you click on print this one, and it says make sure you use the same settings. And again, I already have the velvet settings dialed in. I would click on print, and then click on next. Now, somebody asked, how long do you let it dry? Um, okay, uh, depends on the paper, depends on your environment. Uh, most coated stocks like a gloss, uh, heavily coated stocks like a glossy or a luster, uh, 10 minutes is fine unless it's extremely humid out. I have uh, been in some locations in New York City in the summer where uh, after 10 minutes this, the paper was still tacky. So you do want to make sure it feels dry to the touch and most new papers are really good. They're, they dry very quickly. If you're dealing with fine art papers, some of them will change color for a little longer time. Uh, because the ink soaks down into the paper a little more and they tell you that the paper is going to change color for as much as 24 hours. So if that's the case, what I would do is just print out the target, let it sit, I'll come back tomorrow and read it in. And that's what I'm doing right now. I, I already have my targets printed so I can skip the drying process. Click on next and just like with the first one, just click and drag. Now the difference between this and a, a canned profile, a factory profile that you would maybe download for a particular paper. Factory profiles are generic. Okay, by the way, we just read in all 100 patches. Uh, I'm going to get rid of the rest of this stuff. I will call it 2880 because it does match to the printer type. Okay, and I'll save that. Um, <clears throat> A factory profile is better than no profile at all. But again, it's an average of all the printers and all the environments. If you're in a higher altitude or it's more humid or it's less humid, you're going to get a slight bit different change. And in fact, actually, I'm going to show you that in just a second. Okay, profile's done. You can make your profile be your default if you primarily uh, print on just one paper. I print on many papers, so I do not do that step. And we're done. Now, I'm actually going to quit the Color Monkey software. I'm going to show you something cool. <clears throat> Whoops. Actually, let me ex exit out of PowerPoint here a second. On the Mac, there's a utility called the Color Sync Utility would allow, that allows us to actually take a look at profiles. And what I'm going to do is bring up a Color Monkey profile that we created, and I'm going to compare it to a factory profile. Okay. For example, here is Epson's Somerset Velvet Fine Art Paper Profile. That is the factory profile, which is lovely. It doesn't tell us much, however, by itself. So what we're going to do is hold it. And I'm going to bring up 
the profile we just created. Here it is, Tuesday Velvet. So let's see how close our custom profile matches the factory profile. And when I do that, you can see now the custom profiles in color, the one we just created. The factory profile is that white thing that's surrounding it. And you can see they're slightly different. Not too bad, not really violently different, but you can see the factory profile is saying we can print more green and more yellow than we really can. It's, it's saying we have a little more range in the light, but a lot less range in the dark. You can see our custom profile is telling us we've got a lot more down here in, in the dark. Let's take a look at one other paper while we're here. Let's take a look at the factory profile for premium luster, which is a very common one. I will hold that for comparison. So again, I can spin this around. That's the color space or the color gamut for premium luster paper. Well, let's take a look at our color monkey profile for premium luster, which is right here. And you can see, again, they're different. In fact, they're a lot different uh, in this case. There's a lot more space. So the factory profile is saying it can print out all these blues and magentas that my paper and my printer actually can't do. And having a mismatch in a profile can cause some of your colors to go a little bit wacky. So having a custom profile gives you an exact picture of uh, exactly how your, your printer and your paper combination is printed. Now, how often do you need to profile your printer? Good question. Uh, actually, not that frequently. Once you do a paper, you're pretty much done with it. Uh, once you have a, a, a profile for luster on your printer, then that's good. You have to have a profile for each of your papers, however. And if you buy a new printer, obviously you need one for that. And if you buy a new paper or the paper name changes, that means something else has changed in the coding or something like that, then you need to reprofile. But if you're changing your inks, uh, no need to do that, only when uh, you're getting involved in a new paper. Okay, so let's see. A couple other questions. All right. So, yes, if you get a new box of paper, do you need to read profile? No. Uh, papers are fairly consistent. Uh, only, again, if you're changing papers or if the name changes. And as far as, uh, here's a good question. Uh, so, uh, again, this is a kind of a subject for another day. Do you need to create a profile for different lighting conditions? Um, that is a personal preference. Uh, I do not. Uh, I will adjust the brightness if I'm in a very bright room, but other than that, I do not create profiles for my monitor for different lighting conditions. However, if I'm doing... Um, printing for a gallery that's going to have a specific light, that's a subject for another day. You need a different device and software for that. Now, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to discuss black and white. Let me jump back into the Color Monkey software a second, because there's something really cool you can do with black and white. Okay, so is, is a profile important for black and white? The answer is absolutely. A profile will affect your black and white as well. Now, one thing you can do is you can bring up a profile and optimize it. So if I shall just choose the one we just created, where did it go? Tuesday Velvet, here it is. And what you can do is load an image into here. So I could actually go in and load in a black and white image. Uh, let's see if I can find one real quick. I don't know that I necessarily have one available, but let's take a look. Um, nope, I don't have one really handy at the moment. So let's take one that's got a lot of black and gray in it. We'll just take this one. And what it does is uh, it brings an image in and when I click on next what the software will do is extract another chart of colors that are uh, new to the software. They haven't seen these particular colors for and it extracts them out of the image. Uh, if you send it a, if you give it a black and white image, you'll get an entire sheet like this of different values of gray. So it will also allow you to create a, a profile that is more optimized for um, more prof more optimized for uh, black and white imaging on your particular printer. So yes, it is important to do that as well. Uh, a couple of questions here. Let's see. Um, Okay, uh, somebody asked about projectors, which you're setting me up here. Uh, somebody, uh, Lisa had seen uh, 
uh, Eddie Tapp on tour. Eddie is actually a good friend, and we do uh, we do uh, workshops together. And he had the same laptop and the same calibrated projector, but he had to calibrate it every city because the screens are different. True, the screens, the ambient light is different, and the color of the screens is different. And why do you need to do this? Well. In our studio, we use our projector to do two things. One, we teach with it, and two, we actually sell to it. We show our clients uh, edited, Im edited images before they go to print using a projector. And it's important that the projector matches the actual color, like just like we see on our laptop. I, I'm sure you've all been at talks where the, where the uh, speaker has said, oh, I wish you could see it on my screen because this projector's awful. Well, with a, with a, a uh, calibrated projector, you don't have to make that apology because your projector ends up looking just like your screen. And it's just like doing a monitor, you just choose uh, the projector. The difference is that on the Color Monkey, you rotate it to this mid position because if you actually looked at a Color Monkey, you'd see there's a big window there that allows the sensor to read out. And what then the software does is it projects the colors on the screen. Now, if you've got a screen that's a little bit yellow, maybe it's a little old, maybe you're stuck pr uh, having to use a wall. Um, the profile, when it's created, will co those, that color will come through in those projected colors and the profile will adjust for that. So that's what Eddie was talking about. Uh, you got to make sure that the screen isn't adding its own flavor and uh, by doing a custom profile for each screen it will actually take care of that. Okay, uh, a couple of you have asked for uh, what if you're sending your photos to a lab? Stay tuned. I will get there in a second. I'm going to be showing you that in Photoshop. So good question. Uh, also, oh, Steve asked a good question about Lion. Are new profiles required? Uh, Steve, that's a good question. Um, Lion uh, changed things for certain older systems, uh, but the Color Monkey uh, wasn't really affected by it, so the profile should, should be just fine. Uh, I haven't upgraded to Lion because I never upgrade to an operating system that ends in zero. I will wait for 10.7.1. Um, however, that said, uh, the Color Monkey should be just fine. Uh, and a couple of you have asked about ASO monitors that they have Color Navigator. Uh, yes, uh, Color Navigator is what you should use for your ASOs. And use the Color Monkey software for doing your printer profile. And also, lastly, uh, uh, William asks about what if you have uh, the what's the if the color of the surface underneath your paper is different. Uh, now, most inkjet papers are fairly thick. If you, if you hold them up to the light, not really a lot comes through. And if you put them on a white table or a black table, you generally not much of a change. However, if you want to play it safe, what I'd recommend doing is simply put a second sheet of paper. Uh, oh, and also one other question. Somebody asked, do I recommend using uh, version 2 or version 4 ICC profiles? Uh, it depends on your printer driver, actually. ICC 4 is the newer one, <clears throat> and it's technically a little bit better. But there are a lot of printer drivers um, and some operating system combinations that have fits with version 4, which is the newer one. Uh, so if you want to play it safe, uh, I do personally own some older printers as well. I have an Epson 7600, which I've had for about eight years now. Uh, for, so I stick with version 2. That's my personal thing. Uh, the default is version 4, though. Uh, so you would have to go into the preferences and change that. And one last time for some, of, some that uh, uh, joined us late. Before you start your monitor profiling, what you should do is set it back to factory defaults if your monitor has that option. Uh, if not... Um, the brightness and uh, color settings should be, well, they're different on every monitor, unfortunately. Some call them sRGB, some call them Cal for calibration. Um, you don't want to have the monitor set to one of its flavors, um, like some of them are set for TV or movies or sports or something like that, because they change the contrast and the saturation of the image. So whatever the default basic is, uh, and as far as brightness goes, when you run the Color Monkey software, it will take it will tell you uh, what the brightness needs to be adjusted to okay so we got our profile for our projector as well so again remember the beauty of the projector profiling is you get to show your images bigger I don't have to print really large sample prints for my customers so that they can they can see how they're going to look before they actually get printed and by having a profile at the location uh, it takes into account if the screen happens to be discolored as well all right, we are about to move into Photoshop because we got some uh, 
some fun stuff to do there <clears throat> which is soft proofing and soft proofing is where Photoshop shows you uh, what the image is going to look like on that particular paper through its profile before you actually print now one last thing we need to discuss before we get into there is rendering intents and this is something that drives people nuts and rendering intents are the things that deal with colors that are out of gamut meaning colors that are beyond that particular paper printer combination to print you might have some kind of really bright neon intense color that your paper just can't reproduce uh, your, your um, inkjet papers and printers are limited in certain color ranges so what's going to happen to those colors um, common in flowers for example flowers have a lot of very intense colors in them maybe you have a really extremely bright yellow that your paper is just not going to print so what happens to those colors that's what the rendering intent does two choices for us photographers relative color metric and perceptual yes there are four in Photoshop only those two in Lightroom let's take a look at them first one perceptual rendering perceptual rendering takes those colors that are at a gamut and moves them back in and here that's illustrated by this kind of black circle here and as they get moved in any colors that were in the way get pushed out of the way so what it's doing is it's maintaining the relationship between the previously out of gamut colors and the in gamut colors advantage to this is if you have lots of large solid areas or slightly gradated areas it will maintain uh, the transition you'll, you'll eliminate any choice of uh, chance of banding in those however the downside to perceptual is it can just a couple of pixels out of gamut can cause an overall color shift in the image so again that's we're going to take a look at that in Photoshop now rel relative color metric is the other common one same thing happens the colors that were out of gamut get moved into the closest point however all the colors that were in gamut stay exactly where they are now if you just have a little bit of color out of gamut relative color metrics generally going to be the choice if you're dealing with uh, portraits however I generally find that perceptual works better but it's a guideline not a rule and we're gonna that's where we're gonna take a look in in Photoshop the downside of relative color metric is if you do have uh, a bunch of color or a bunch of pixels out of gamut um, and you have large uh, gradated areas like a sky for example you've got a sky that's deep blue up at the top and goes to lighter at the horizon what can end up happening is you'll get banding in the sky and or you'll start to get kind of grunge uh, kind of uh, kind of an extra grain so again that's why we're going to take a look in Photoshop and let's actually do that let's go into Photoshop and see how to apply this so first I'm going to hide the other stuff so we have a clean screen so let's open an image and let's see let me get to here let me just check a couple questions here um, <clears throat> uh, Joe asked about wouldn't relative color metrics be better for portraits mm, not necessarily in fact let's do that let's take a look it may it may not it's you can't say sometimes relative color metric is better for landscape uh, let's we'll start with a portrait so let's go ahead and open one up and let's let me just get this full screen okay now I actually subdued this image a lot from the original effect I'll turn off the layer so you can see where I started I decided to really focus in on the subject by darkening the uh, the background and uh, this arm coming through on her shawl here um, again a subject for another day this is uh, I do do Photoshop I'm gonna be doing some Photoshop portrait and landscape editing classes uh, in the early fall so stay tuned for those I want to see how this is gonna print however before I print it so how do you do that this is the step view proof setup custom and I get my customized proof condition and the device to simulate is where you dial in your profile so I click on here and scroll down and here's where my habit of naming all my profiles with CM in front of it becomes handy because I know they're all going to be in the same place so here's our velvet paper so we'll select that and the default starting point you see was relative color metric so if I turn this on and off do you see any change it's subtle but actually if you take a close look you can see 
the background, when I turn the profile on, the background is lightening a little bit. You see that? Now again, this is a matte paper. So that's expected. The blacks aren't going to be quite as intense. And I can decide to live with that or I can adjust it. Now before I decide what, um, which profile I'm going to use or which, if I'm going to make any adjustments, let's take a look at Perceptual. So when I turn on Perceptual, you can see not only does the background lighten, but the entire face lightens. Now in this particular image, it, this is where it becomes subjective. Looking at it on my monitor, well, I kind of like the perceptual look. It adds a little more life to the face. Let me take a look at relative color metric. Darkens up the image a smidge. And again, I don't know what you guys are looking at because I don't know if you're looking at this on a calibrated monitor. But on my calibrated monitor, when I take a look, I happen to like the perceptual look to the skin tones. I like what it did. However, it did lighten up my background a little bit, so that's okay. I'm going to hit OK. Oh, before I leave here, this always comes up, these buttons here. Preserve RGB numbers. Never check it. Bad things will happen. They should just get rid of this in the next version of Photoshop. Black point compensation should be turned on. I've never come across a, a print that it did not work better. This thing, however, this display options on screen. What this is supposed to do is take a look at the profile data and simulate the effect of the color of the paper. The problem is, it is so overblown to be useless. If I click on this, look what it does to the image. It completely washes it out. And I know that the, my, my paper does not lose that much density. Nice idea in practice. It just doesn't work. My recommendation to you is ignore this. It's just, it's, someday maybe it will work. Right now, it just does not. So I click OK. And what I'm going to do is, again, I'm looking at this through the profile. See, it says proof colors. So we were looking at this through the profile we just created. What I'm going to do is add a little more density to the black just to kind of get it back. So I'm going to do that with a curve. So I'm going to add a curve adjustment layer. Now, for those of you that were afraid of curves, you, you, you can add points here and, and adjust the midtones, adjust the shadows, etc. Well, an easy way to do it in the latest versions of Photoshop is to use the little, uh, I don't know what this is called, the little adjustment pointy finger thingy. I'm going to click on that, and I'm going to come back to this dark green, and I'm just going to click and drag down. And what that does, you can see, it actually changes the curve for you. It places the point in the right spot, and just a little bit was all it needed. And I can turn this on and off, and you can see what it did was it gave me back that density in the background. That's as simple as that was. Now, this is only, however, for the Somerset paper. So what I'm going to do is call it Curve Velvet. I'm going to give it a name because I don't necessarily want to increase the density of the background if I was using a glossy stock. I'll just leave this in as layers, and now when I go out to print, this is what's going to show up on my printer. So let's go through the print dialog box real quick. Oop, I had this size differently. Let me size it to my paper. So, print settings. Let's just check that one more time. And which right where we left it. If I was printing on a different paper, I would tell it. I am printing on my velvet paper, so I'll just leave that there. Here's the important one. If you've never done this before, the default is printer manages colors. We want Photoshop to manage the colors because we created a custom printer profile and we dial it in here. So I click it. I wish it carried over from our proof, but it does not. So I have to tell it Tuesday Velvet. I decided for this particular image, I liked what Perceptual did. Yes, black point compensation is turned on. Lastly, these things right underneath here, they're similar to that, uh, that soft proofing paper thing that I showed you was worthless in uh, the, the uh, uh, soft proof. Well, this is just another soft proof for this thumbnail has no effect on the print. Uh, it just has a tendency to wash things out. Again, I think this is a waste of time, so I'd recommend don't mess with it. Then you click on print, and a beautiful thing happens. The print that comes out of your printer looks like what you see on the screen here, and that's, of course, what we're, what we're after. Okay, let's. Uh, I'm going to close this one. Actually, I will save that. I like that uh, little adjustment we made. And let's bring up a landscape just so we have something a little different. I'm going to open up one of my favorite landscape demos because it has kind of a uh, um, 
dramatic change. All right, so let me just zoom in on this a bit. Okay. People always ask, by the way, this is uh, Cape May, New Jersey. Okay. Oh, and yes, for those of you that are asking, uh, if again, if you join late, I probably didn't even say it at the beginning, this is being recorded. Uh, we'll let you know when it's available. We'll send out a follow-up email uh, probably tomorrow, uh, and we'll let you know where the recording is. So, again, view proof setup, custom. Now, it carried through from my last proof setup. It sees that I used Somerset Velvet. However, as I turn this on and off, under perceptual, you can see the entire image lightening. I don't know if I like that. I think it's lightening it a little too much. So let's see what relative color metric does. Better. Now if I turn this on and off, subtle, subtle change. And the change is happening on both of these right here in this red bow of this boat. What it's saying is that that red is just too intense a red for this, this Somerset Velvet paper, by the way, for those of you who haven't seen it, is kind of almost like a watercolor paper. Uh, so it just can't give me that intense a color. So I'm going to hit OK. I'm also going to zoom in a bit so we can see this a little better. And I'm going to turn on the gamut warning, which is right underneath the proof colors button. And actually, you can kind of see it in here. See, uh, I'll turn it on and off. You see this bright green? that's appeared around that light. Uh, you can see it on through these uh, cables and it actually is even in the water reflection right there. Now if you have never done this before, uh, the default for the gamut warning is kind of a mid-gray that's kind of hard to see. If you go in the Photoshop preferences under uh, transparency and gamut, you see the gamut warning color. Click on it. The default again is something like this which is impossible to find. I like to use this kind of lime green because it's easy to show up. But it kind of lets me see uh, where are the trouble colors that, there are, that are at a gamut. And just that little bit is causing an overall shift in perceptual. That, again, that's the danger of perceptual. Oh, just as uh, to show you something more violent, let's uh, go into custom. And instead of using this coated velvet stock, just to show you what would happen if we were printing on new, uncoated newspaper. Say it's going out to a newspaper. So let's go to, we'll do web uncoated, and there you see all of those colors are at a gamut for that uncoated paper stock. So just kind of a warning there. So again, let's go to our CM Tuesday Velvet. And again, I decided that Perceptual lightened up the image maybe a bit too much. So I'm going to stick with relative color metric on this one. Now, I did mention that this red was losing. I can turn the, the proof on and off. You see as I turn it on, as I cycle it on and off, I'm just hitting the keyboard shortcut command Y, the red is lightening. Now, I cannot make this red print on this paper. It's beyond the gamut. It's something you have to live with. However, what I can do is at least go in maybe and darken some of the other areas up that got a little bit lighter. So to do that, my favorite way to do that Let's create a new layer. By the way, guys, I see it's 12.01. I just want to finish this edit. Okay, if I run a little later, you guys, you guys with me here? Because after this, I want to show you how to print to a lab. Okay, I create a new layer, and I change it from normal to overlay. And that's how I like to do all of my uh, burning and dodging. Change it to overlay, get myself a brush quick shortcut, let's see, give me going to save a right brush size, and I'm going to paint it about 20%. So you can see I've got the opacity at 20%, and I'm going to just paint with black here. And I see my Photoshop doesn't like to redraw at an intermediate, intermediate uh, zoom here. So let me go back to full screen. So you can see as I turn this on and off, what I've just done is I've painted with black on this area at 20% to just bring back a little bit of that density. So again, if I turn that on and off, and again, we're looking at this through the proof. Remember, we're looking at this through the proof color. This is the effect that the paper has on this particular print. So now I've got that little density back a little bit. Maybe I overdid it. 
So I'll just bring the opacity down a little bit. Yeah, I'll bring it to 50%. And okay, yes, we're losing some intensity in these reds. Nothing I can do about that. That red cannot be printed on that paper, so it's going to do the closest it can. I just adjusted the density of the darker areas around it to give it a little bit more pop. So that's it. So now again, once again, click on Print. Photoshop manages colors. I'm using Tuesday Velvet. And for this one, I decided that Relative Color Metric was a better choice. Again, click on Print, and it comes out of your printer looking like this. Now, what if I'm sending out to a lab? Good question. Okay, your labs, whoops, I didn't want to do that. Your labs operate, all your lab machinery, almost all the lab machinery, operates in the sRGB color space or something very close to it. And that's what labs generally want from you when you send out to print. They want an sRGB JPEG. So in this case, in order to see how it's going to print on the lab, I go to View Proof Setup Custom, and my device to simulate, instead of my printer profile, is going to be up top here. I'm actually going to proof it, soft proof it, to sRGB. Ah, oh, this was an Adobe RGB image. Now you can see I've got a different set of color gamut warnings. So let's see what Perceptual does. All right, so I've got my, let me turn off the gamut warning. And let's take a look at the proof setup again. Proof setup custom turn on the preview. It's actually a very subtle change under Perceptual. All right, so let's see what, rel what the relative color metric looks like. Again, very subtle. It's telling me some of the colors are a little bit too intense. They will move very slightly. You can barely see it. So actually, in this case, relative color metric or Perceptual, I don't even know how well you guys are seeing it. I like what Perceptual did, but again, this is the subjective part. This is where you make the call. I decided I like Perceptual for sRGB. Hit OK. The last step I need to do is I need to convert this image to an sRGB JPEG. So I do that under Edit, Convert to Profile. You can see this is an Adobe RGB image. I'm going to change it to sRGB. I do want black point compensation on, and I decided that I liked the perceptual better for this image. I'll just hit OK. I did not flatten the image because in the newer Photoshops, when I save as a JPEG, it will do that for me automatically. So I do File Save As. I'm rushing a little bit because I'm out of time, so stay with me. Choose JPEG, and you see here Embed Color Profile sRGB. Click on Save. And I'll go ahead and replace that. That's okay. And now I have a file ready to go to my lab. What I typically do, uh, I always save it at the highest quality. Uh, I do have a folder on my desktop called For Lab, uh, and all my prints that have been converted to the lab live there uh, so that I can then upload them en masse. So that's it. So is there a thumb rule on rendering intent? Good question. Unfortunately, the answer is no. Uh, you got to take a look. It's going to depend on the image. It's going to depend on the colors in the image. Uh, now, David does mention that some labs offer uh, profiles to download. That is true. Strangely enough, generally it's the lower end labs like uh, uh, BJ's or, or uh, places like that. Um, so they will offer you a, a printer profile to download. Is it a big advantage over just using a sRGB profile? Not, not in my experience, no. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with using it. Uh, their, their printer has a profile that is very slightly different than sRGB. However, understand that these labs, the software that drives these things, knows how to do this very well. It knows how to take those sRGB JPEGs, and if there's any translation, it knows how to move it into its printer space with no discernible color changes. So that's generally... Uh, that's how I work with all my labs, and it works. Uh, oh, one last point. Uh, 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 somebody asked about uh, gamma choice between 1.8 and 2.2 for monitor calibration. And uh, there, that's a universal now, actually. I can go back in the Color Monkey software one last time. Let's take a look at the preferences real quick. 
take a look here. The default is 2.2. 1.8 is a holdover for you Mac guys, and I am a Mac guy. Uh, 1.8 is a holdover going way back to the laser writer. And if you guys remember the laser writer, you're almost as old as I am. Uh, so everybody's 2.2 now. All right, so just stick with it. Uh, as far as ICC profile version, here's where you change that if you have an older printer. Uh, again, I have a couple of older printers. I've got a 7600, I have a 3800. Uh, they don't like the version 4 profiles, so I am on version 2. Uh, if you've got all the latest, greatest stuff, then you can take advantage of 4. And you see you have a separate setting for uh, monitor versus uh, printer. Actually, I'm on the, I'm, I, I am on a, a new operating system. I'm on uh, Snow Leopard on my Mac, so I can choose version 4 for my uh, display. But for my printer, since I am still with older printers, I will stick with the version 2. So that's, uh, that's how that works. Okay. Oh, and some of you are asking questions I would never say in public, like, what is my favorite lab? I will say, uh, I will say, uh, uh, they're well-known names. There's, I use four different labs, uh, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna promote labs here personally. If you guys want to send, I'll give you an email address afterwards. All right. If you guys got a personal question like that to ask me, I'd be happy to recommend. All right. So let's finish up because I have run over. Okay. So we got our rendering tents. Lastly, you're taking a look at your prints after they come out of your printer or back from your lab. What are you looking at them under? Well. A viewing booth is really expensive. At the least, get yourself some daylight spectrum lights. You don't have to spend a lot of money. Um, I have a couple of daylight lamps that I picked up at the, the local home store. Uh, I, I have one over my print. I have actually two of them over my printer uh, and one over my viewing area uh, where I do my like, trimming. It just allows you to really see what your print really looks like. Uh, strangely enough, uh, 6500K versus 5000. Uh, which are both considered daylight temperature. Um, even though it's a big number difference, there's not a huge difference to our eyes in the color rendition. 3200K is tungsten, however, which is very yellow. And the color of the light has a tendency to kill or diminish its opposite. The opposite of yellow is blue. So you can see in this 3200K sample, a lot of the blues have been kind of diminished. Fluorescent lights, Non-daylight temperature fluorescent lights, actually, and actually a lot of fluorescent lights, have a very strong green spike in them. Your eyes can't see it. Your eyes automatically filter it out, but it is there. And what happens then is the green, the opposite of green, is magenta. So it has a tendency to cancel out magenta, so you end up getting that. So do make sure that you are uh, viewing your lights, viewing your prints, rather, under daylight. And if you're going to spend the money for a really good fine art print, that's going to hang in a wall, then I'd highly recommend getting yourself some daylight lights to illuminate that image. So let's summarize soft proofing. First of all, before you do any soft proofing, if you don't have a calibrated uh, and profile monitor, it's a waste of time. Make sure you get that. Photoshop's doing the color management, not the driver. Make sure in the printer driver, anywhere color management, the word color management or color comes up other than black and white, uh, make sure that all the color management stuff in the driver is turned off and then judge your prints under a daylight spectrum light and you're going to see a beautiful thing happen. Prints off your printer, prints back from your lab, prints in books are all going to look like what you saw on your screen. So think about color from the start. Get that monitor and printer profile. Go through the soft proofing. I know that the soft proofing seems a little complicated. Again, this is being recorded. So you can review the steps uh, and, and give it a play. It really is, once you get the hang of it, it's not that hard. And you'll have prints that will match your monitor. Not only is it going to save you time and money, but it's going to save you a lot of frustration. So again, we've talked about the Color Monkey today. Uh, Color Monkey is one of my favorite devices because of its speed and its ability to do the printer, the projector, and the screen. If you got a question I could not get to, please send me an email. Send it to answers at xrightphoto.com. It will come to me, and I will do my best to get you an answer as soon as possible. So I've run out of time. Uh, thank you so much for spending time with us today. And until next time, everybody have a great week and a great weekend. See you soon. Bye-bye.